Differential geometry, the study of smooth shapes and surfaces, otherwise known as smooth manifolds. But did you know that differential geometry would be impossible without the seven discoveries that preceded it? The first one is parametric representation of curves and surfaces. Normally, if we were to describe a circle of radius 1, we could do so like this. Here, the points x, y on the circle are defined indirectly. You must solve the equation or check a point against it. There is no explicit formula to produce points directly, and analyzing local properties like slopes of tangents requires solving equations each time. But in the 1700s, Leonard Euler and Gaspard Monge greatly advanced a different technique called parametric representation. Parametric representation involves describing geometric shapes, so curves and surfaces, through smooth functions that depend on one or more parameters. Instead of describing a shape implicitly, we explicitly represent each coordinate as a function of one or more variables, known as parameters. A general parametric form looks like this, which is a curve, r of t, with coordinates x, y, and z, with one parameter t. For a surface, we have s of uv with its components x, y, z, depending on the parameters uv. For the circle, we, instead of representing it implicitly with x squared plus y squared equals 1, we can represent it explicitly with r of t as cosine of t, sine of t, and t ranging from 0 to 2 pi. So what are we doing exactly when we parametrize it? Let's take an example xy as 20 cosine of t, 20 sine of t. We're explicitly describing every point on the circle as the tip of a vector of length 20, rotating around the origin. The parameter t represents the angle that the rotating vector makes with the x-axis. Parametrically, you are explicitly generating points as you smoothly move the angle t around the circle. Before Euler and Monge, geometry was primarily studied using classical Euclidean tools, like straight line, compasses, and implicit algebraic equations. Parametric representation brought us the ability to visualize how shapes form and change continuously. Plus, it made clear definitions of tangent vectors and tangent planes possible. Gauss's Theorema Egregium, or Remarkable Theorem. When we think of a surface, we usually think of it as embedded in a space. But in 1827, in his paper, Gauss proved that Gaussian curvature, denoted as k, of a surface is an intrinsic property. Intrinsic means that curvature depends solely on distances measured on the surface itself, completely independent of how the surface is embedded in 3D space. Simply put, even if you bend or reshape the surface without stretching it, the Gaussian curvature at each point remains the same. Surfaces could be studied completely internally, without reference to the surrounding space. Consider the sphere, which is naturally curved everywhere. Gaussian curvature k is positive everywhere. Specifically, k equals 1 over r squared, for a sphere of radius r. Because it's positive, the sphere cannot be flattened into a plane without stretching. An example is the map of the Earth, which is distorted when flattened. If we take a cylinder, it's visually curved when we see it in 3D space. But it's not truly curved because you can flatten it out into a rectangle without distorting it. This is known as an isometric transformation. Its Gaussian curvature is k equals 0. Thus, surfaces could now be classified by intrinsic curvature. k greater than 0 are sphere-like surfaces. k equals 0 are flat surfaces like planes and cylinders. k less than 0 are saddle-shaped surfaces. Thus, Gauss set the stage for surfaces to be studied independent of their embeddings and become a modern abstract discipline. The third is Riemann's generalization of geometry. Created by Bernard Riemann, Riemannian geometry studies abstract spaces, known as manifolds, defined locally by a smoothly varying object called a metric tensor. To put it simply, Riemann took Gauss' idea that geometry could be studied intrinsically and generalized it. Gauss' theorem 
was revolutionary, but still limited to two-dimensional surfaces embedded in three-dimensional spaces. Riemann filled this gap and generalized it so radically that geometry became about abstract shapes and spaces in any dimension. Let's revisit the sphere, but we'll look at it through the lens of Riemannian geometry. A sphere, considered as a Riemannian manifold, is locally very similar to a flat plane. At every point on the surface, you can create a small flat map or coordinate chart just as small regions on the Earth's surface appear flat to us locally. But combining many of these small charts, you form what's called an atlas, which smoothly covers the whole surface. Each chart comes with what is known as a metric tensor, a smoothly varying inner product that tells us how to measure distances and angles directly on the sphere, independently of any external coordinates or embeddings. For example, in spherical coordinates, the metric tensor at a point on a sphere with radius r is given by this. Distances, angles, and curvature are computed intrinsically, without the need to embed the surface. This can be done in limitless dimensions. Fourth, the Christoffel symbols. Riemann provided the broad concept of manifolds and intrinsic metrics but didn't yet offer a straightforward way to explicitly differentiate vector fields on curved spaces. This was solved by Elwin Bruno Christoffel, who developed Christoffel symbols, often denoted as gamma kij. They are mathematical objects that encode how coordinate systems change as you move around on curved spaces, or manifolds. More intuitively speaking, they provide the machinery for comparing vectors locally for different points on the manifold, defining what it means for vectors to be parallel, and describing how vectors change directions intrinsically. Formally, they are defined in terms of the metric tensor Gij on the manifold. These symbols serve as coefficients in the definition of covariant derivatives, a generalization of ordinary derivatives to curved spaces. Consider again a sphere of radius r in spherical coordinates. The metric tensor is this. Using Christoffel's formula, we can explicitly compute the symbols. For example, a few Christoffel symbols for this sphere are minus sine of theta, cosine of theta, and cotangent of theta. They tell you explicitly how vectors change when you move along certain directions enabling you to determine the shortest path, known as geodesics, or the intrinsic acceleration or curvature effects. For example, when navigating on Earth, Christoffel symbols would explicitly tell you how a direction, like north, changes as you move along a parallel latitude line. Even if you feel you are moving straight, your compass direction changes intrinsically due to curvature. Tensor Calculus, or Absolute Differential Calculus Tensor Calculus organizes information about vectors, matrices, and more general multidimensional entities into objects called tensors, whose properties remain consistent and invariant under coordinate transformations. Tensors generalize scalars, which are zero-dimensional, vectors, which are one-dimensional, and matrices, which are two-dimensional, to higher dimensions. Christoffel symbols made differentiation of vector fields and curvature calculations practical, but were not fully coordinate independent themselves. They depend explicitly on the choice of the coordinate system, but tensors are explicitly coordinate independent. Consider again the sphere or any curved manifold. The Riemann curvature tensor, denoted as this, holds all the information about how space curves at every point. Formally, the curvature tensor is given in terms of Christoffel symbols as the following. If you pick a different coordinate system, the tensor's numerical components might change, but the tensor itself describes the same intrinsic curvature. From this curvature tensor, you can derive simpler tensors, like the Ricci curvature tensor, important in general relativity, and scalar curvature, giving an intrinsic measure of curvature magnitude. For example, 
The curvature tensor on a sphere of radius r simplifies considerably, reflecting its constant curvature everywhere. Number 6. Covariant Differentiation In flat spaces, ordinary derivatives work fine. But on curved spaces, straightforward derivatives aren't enough. Vectors at different points live in different tangent spaces, so you can't simply subtract them or take differences in the usual sense. You need a way to transport vectors intrinsically and smoothly. Covariant differentiation solves this problem. It was developed by Gregorio Ricci Curbastro and Tullio Levi Civita. Covariant differentiation is a method of differentiating vectors and tensors along curved manifolds in a manner that respects the manifold's intrinsic geometry. Formally, covariant differentiation of a vector field Vi along the coordinate direction xj is expressed as the following. Notice the Christoffel symbol here. Covariant differentiation tells you exactly how vectors should change, and this happens as you move along a path to remain intrinsically parallel. On the sphere, it predicts how much your arrow turns relative to your original direction after traveling along certain paths. This is known as holonomy. Mathematically, covariant differentiation describes this as the condition the covariant derivative of the vector field along the path is zero, indicating that the vector vi is parallel transported and not changing intrinsically along the path. Carton's method of moving frames. Covariant differentiation still relied heavily on coordinate systems and algebraic complexity. This messed with its intuitive geometric meaning. So in the early 1920s, Ali Carton introduced his method of moving frames. It's a geometric approach that studies curves, surfaces, and higher dimensional manifolds through carefully chosen local coordinate frames. Consider a curve in 3D space, for example, a helix winding around a cylinder. At each point on this helix, Carton's moving frame gives us a set of three orthonormal vectors, the Fresnes array frame. The tangent vector t points along the curve's direction. The normal vector n points inward towards the curve's center of curvature. The binormal vector, b, is perpendicular to both t and n, giving a third spatial direction. Formally, a frame at each point on a manifold is just a collection of vectors forming a basis for the tangent space. As you move on the manifold, this basis smoothly changes. This motion is described by differential equations known as Carton's structure equations. Carton's equations explicitly capture this motion. Here, kappa is curvature, Tau is torsion, and S is the arc length parameter. Notice how simple and elegant these equations are, revealing precisely how the curve's geometry evolves intrinsically. Carton's method of moving frames was the final innovation that made differential geometry fully intrinsic, visual, and intuitive. And these are the discoveries that allowed us to get to differential geometry. If you like this video, I'm sure you're going to love this one. See you guys there.